I want to begin our discussion on Homer, on his Iliad and on his Odyssey, by first looking at a response to Homer that takes place in the 19th century by John Keats. And the reason I want to start here is because I think it's important for us to recognize that for a long time people didn't have access to Homer in the English translation. Originally, Homer is written in Greek, and if we look back, a lot of civilization in Western culture had actually forwent their knowledge of Greek. They stopped studying the Greek. Um, most people still had versions of the Iliad or the Odyssey, but they merely used them as tokens. Uh, they couldn't read the actual translations. Instead, it was more like a good luck charm. Uh, there is a rumor that Petrarch, the Italian poet in the 14th century, actually used to kiss his copy as a good luck charm. So what we have in the translations that come out between the 16th century and the 19th century in English was kind of an eye-opening experience of Homer. It was reintroducing Homer to the English-speaking world. And if we look at John Keats in 1819, when he first read Homer, you get to see this elation, this sense of discovery. The sense of discovery is what I hope everyone feels when they first are introduced to Homer, as though the world is opening up, as though they are entering a new cosmos and finding, finding themselves, but also finding Homer. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, John Keats, 1816. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards and fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he starred the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Notice in this poem that you have Chapman giving access to Homer. The world was there, but, but the map that was needed. And Chapman's translation of Homer allowed Keats to travel backwards, allowed Keats the opportunity to visit Homer's cosmos, to visit Homer's world. If we look at this poem, we see that there's a sense of discovery, of being a traveler, of getting to go back to Homer's time. And that's what we have to remember as we start reading the poem. When we read, we have a tendency sometimes to bring the author to us, to imagine that Homer is a guest at our table but as Alan Jacobs puts it in his book, Breaking Bread with the Dead, we are traveling back in time to be guests at others' tables. We cannot impose our own sense of values or our own understanding of the world upon Homer. We need to be like Keats with a sense of discovery, going back into Homer's cosmos, into Homer's world, and seeing what it is that we discover there. So what do we expect to discover when we venture into Homer's world? Why, in a sense, does Homer matter? We are talking about a poem, uh, at least in terms of the Iliad and the Odyssey, that probably were composed in the eighth century. And we'll talk a little bit about their composition. But we know that they are millennia away from us. They're poems that seem not to write about our current world, and yet they do. They're writing about real people, not real in the empirical sense, or maybe, but real in a much deeper way. Real in a sense that these are human beings with all the variety and complexity of emotions that that implies. These are people who have desires, who have wants, who have loves. And so what we discover when we venture back into Homer's time is the universal and the timeless. Things that even if they were written in the 18th century BC still have relevance to us today. This is the argument that is made by Adam Nicholson in his book, Why Homer Matters. In Why Homer Matters, Adam Nicholson says that he discovered Homer as a guidebook to life, that Homer tells us how we became who we are. The epics, which, according to Nicholson, were invented after memory and before history, then occupy a third space in the human desire to connect the present to the past, as we mentioned with Keats, in being able to travel through time 
and go backwards. The epic attempts to extend the qualities of memory over the reach of time embraced by history. What does this mean? Well, for Nicholson, it means that Homer becomes very personal to him, that Homer becomes a way of investigating not only Homer's world, but also himself, of being able to ask enduring questions about what it means to be a human being. For Nicholson, it means being able to ask the enduring questions about what it means to be a human being. Nicholson can write a book in the 21st century titled Why Homer Matters, which is maybe 4,000 years apart from when Homer was actually composed or which the, when the oral tales were first being sung. Nicholson argues that the work is much older than tradition usually has it, and we will talk about that a little bit more in a second. But either way, whether it was three century or three millennia away or two millennia away or four millennia away, they're thousands of years apart from us. And yet, these are the things that we should be reading. These are the things that we should be knowing. For those who are Christian believers, there is sometimes a protest against reading the pagan works. If we look at the third century writer, Tertullian, he asks a question that was on the minds of those then, and it's on the minds of Christians now. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Now, what does he mean by this question? He is not asking literally what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, but metaphorically and figuratively, what has the city of man to do with the city of God, to use Augustine's language? What does the world of the pagan Greeks and all of their gods have to do with Jerusalem, the city of the triune God? There's a book written by Lois Marcos, who is a great proponent of classical education, entitled From Achilles to Christ. It is a defense for why the Christians should read the pagan classics. On one side of the debate is the protest that the Bible is the only source of truth. We should not read anything but God's word. God reveals to us all that we need to know in the scriptures, and therefore everything else is extraneous. In refutation of this argument is St. Augustine's claim that all truth is God's truth. If we look at a text called De Doctrina Christiana, written by Augustine um, in the 4th century, this text actually provides a great defense for why we should read many things in addition to the Bible. Augustine argues that we should actually study biology, we should study history, and we should study the pagans in order to know better God's word. He uses a metaphor that comes from Exodus when the Egyptians were told by God to actually take the gold from Egypt and bring it forward with them when they exited Egypt. The gold then can, be, can symbolize or be a figure of truth. God is saying the pagan truth that is found in Egypt, bring it forward because it still belongs to me. If it is gold, if it is real, if it is true, it is mine no matter where you find it. This is the approach we're going to take with Homer. If there is truth there to be found, it is the Lord's. Whether or not Homer was the one who accessed it, whether or not he would have recognized it as God's truth. A second objection that is made to reading the ancients comes from Martin Luther. And Luther really just is a stand person for this argument that comes in different forms from different people. The whole world is obliged to confess that it never knew Christ nor heard of him before the gospel came. In contrast to this opinion is the idea that comes from Marcos that Christianity is only the complete truth, but that pagans themselves pointed toward this truth. In other words, we need not to look at Christianity and pagan cultures in opposition from one another but rather that the pagan stories actually move us towards the revelation of Christ, that Christ comes to complete or perfect the knowledge that was lacking in the pagans, but that the two should not be seen antagonistically as much as one builds upon the other, right? These are not warring ideas, but one of them moves towards the greater idea or the greater reality, which is founded on Jesus Christ. Lastly, Lastly is the argument that pagan gods are not our God. Even those who choose to read the old text, Homer, Virgil, and so forth, are constantly contrasting the great triune God with the pagan gods. The pagan gods lack what our God has. 
I think a great way to counter this argument is from G.K. Chesterton, who wrote a history called The Everlisting Man, in which he looks at how God is actually the author of history. The idea that God is the author of history has great ramifications for our studies of the classics. Because if God is authoring history, then God is the one who is revealing himself in different ways to the early pagans in order that by the time we go through Greece and Rome and Jesus Christ is born particularly into that moment in history in which all of these ideas are melding with the Jewish ideas and helping people to understand who God is that we, we don't need to, again, look at these ideas as though they're in contrast, but that God was working through history, that God was bringing forth glimmers of himself. If we look at Romans, right, that um, in all ways, all people were having access to divine revelation, that God was doing that even through history. He was doing it through nature, the book of creation, but he was also doing it through the pagans to, until we come to the point of getting to know Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was born into Rome at a particular time. Um, one of the ways you can also think about this, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to Virgil, is that Virgil, I think it was in uh, 44 AD in the Ecologues, he is writing a prophecy that was actually about Caesar Augustus, but it really does apply to Jesus very well. And so a lot of early Christians would look back at this pagan prophecy about a son being born unto a virgin that was going to come and bring peace into the world, and that this prophecy from Virgil points to the fact that God was working even through these pagan cultures to reveal himself to all the nations. And so we can read the pagans with hope that God is revealing himself, that God is working through these great works of literature, and that one of the reasons they're timeless and eternal is because our God is timeless and eternal, and our God knows how to work through his spirit through both the unbelievers and believers alike. So what are the timeless aspects of Homer? One of the ways that we can establish what it is to be a great book is to consider three things. One, does the work ask enduring questions? This does not mean that it proposes enduring answers to these questions, but does the book itself raise great questions, right? Questions that matter to the human person. And then a second, I think we should look at some of the ones that are raised by Homer. Second, that the work itself is beautiful, beautiful in a timeless sense, beautiful not just for one culture, not for just one place, but beautiful always. And we'll look at Homer's poetry and get to see that this is in fact the case with the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's also the case with Virgil's Aeneid. The beauty found in these epics is timeless. And third, I would say a great book is something that can be lived. It transforms your life after reading it so that you live differently. We want to take these three questions and ask it of Homer's text and ask it of Virgil's text. Are these great books? I think you will see that they are. The questions that are asked by Homer's Iliad and by Homer's Odyssey are these questions, and a lot of them also resonate with Virgil's Aeneid. Why is history saturated with the blood of martyrs, heroes, and innocents? What is the more worthy choice for a life? Content, domesticity, or valor and duty? What does it mean to be a friend, to be a wife? What does it mean to be a mother or a father? And what does it mean to be a son or a daughter? Is this life a cyclical journey with returns and homecomings and exiles and repetitions? Or is it a pilgrimage to an ultimate destination? Are we fated or do we define our own lives by our own will? G.K. Chesterton has a famous quote in The Everlasting Man, the aforementioned work, that if the world becomes pagan again and perishes, the last man left alive would do well to quote the Iliad and die. What Chesterton is alluding to here is that the Iliad has these grand answers for questions. What J.K. Chesterton is alluding to here is that the Iliad and other works like it, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, they're asking the enduring questions. They're asking the things that matter and that a, the last man alive would show his fidelity to being a human person by quoting the Iliad as his last breath. Now let's talk about the subject matter of the Iliad. It begins with the history of the Trojan War, and by the time we enter into the Iliad, the Trojan War has been going on for nine years. So what is the Trojan War? Is this an empirical event? Did this actually happen? There is quite a bit of debate on the history itself. 
but for the sake of at least a little bit of context, I think we should look at what is the history of the Trojan War. As I mentioned, there is debate. First, many scholars believe that the Trojan War took place somewhere around the 13th century BC or 1183, which is the traditional date of the fall of Troy. Troy fell to the Mycenaeans or the Proto-Greeks, the pre-Greek peoples. Um, these people have a history of being rather large. You'll see this throughout the Iliad that Ajax, for example, picks up a stone to hurl it at Hector. Iliad, uh, Homer mentions that a modern day man could not pick up such a stone and throw it. There's also a consideration 13th century BC that these Mycenaeans would have been who the uh, Jews knew as the Philistines, right? The pagan ones. And that these large Philistines, such as Goliath, that this was an aspect of these people, that they were rather large people. So we have the Mycenaean Greeks, these dominating figures coming to Troy to besiege the city of what seems to be noble, peaceful, and uh, rather civilized people in comparison. So we have this contrast between these two different civilizations in the 13th century. There are some people, such as Adam Nicholson and Why Homer Matters, that argue that the fall of Troy actually took place much earlier, perhaps as early as 1800 BC. We're not quite sure. Again, it's looking at the evidence of the ruins of Troy. There's various layers. The city was built upon itself over and over again. Um, so we have Troy 1, Troy 2, Troy 3, Troy 6. We have lots of different layers and they show potentially there were earthquakes, there was destruction of the city, but they can't really date when these things happened exactly and which of them would have been evidence of the fall that is mentioned in Homer's epic. We do know that the alphabet was introduced by the Phoenicians in around 800. It was introduced to Greece uh, at the same time it was, of course, being introduced to the biblical prophets as well, who would have started writing down um, the Torah. So we have a lot of overlap here. I think it's important to recognize that what's going on in this part of the Mediterranean is very close to what's happening in uh, the Jewish scriptures. In the 8th century, we have the Iliad and the Odyssey being transcribed. There is question about the dates, but... The Iliad predates the Odyssey by perhaps 25 years, is the estimation of most scholars. By the time we get to the 4th century with Alexander the Great, and then of course to the 1st uh, century BC with Julius Caesar, we have a lot of people that know these stories well, that love them. We have Alexander visiting Troy. He actually sets up an altar to Achilles. We have Julius Caesar visiting, that these became pilgrimages in a sense to their great events in history. And this was being passed down through the ages as one of the, the great stories of all time.